you know, if there's one question I get asked more than any other, more even than if you were a Spice Girl, what would be your Spice name? That question would have to be, Mark, how can you capture the beauty of an Australian sunset with a roll of Kodak Gold on a medium format Yashica 635 twin lens reflex camera? Well, today we're going to try and answer that question. So one Yashica 635 twin lens reflex camera, one roll of Kodak Gold 200 film and one clumsy photographer. What can go wrong? Well, quite a lot as it happens. I should preface this video by saying that while I have had this camera for a while, I haven't shot that many rolls through it and anyone who has owned a TLR knows that it can be an alienating experience at first. The handling on these things is quite different from SLRs, rangefinders and just about any other film camera. Building up muscle memory for a camera like this takes time and I was out of practice. If that sounds like an excuse, well it is, but hey, Let's learn from my mistakes because I promise you, if you haven't held one of these things in your hands before, you'll probably be making the same ones. Things started off innocuously enough, but as you can see, the sun was already setting and time was against me. So the first setup is fairly straightforward. Pretty much what I want to try and do is capture that image behind me, a few statues against the Indian Ocean as the sun goes down. So as you can see, the sun is setting behind me. There's a beautiful glow behind those tankers. And rather than talk to you, I'm actually going to try and capture this image. And I think that is the last of the light, basically shooting at a 60th of a second around f4.5 to 5.6, somewhere in the middle there, pretty much around f5. Two shots in the bag and so far so good. What I didn't account for though was my complete inability to work with this camera in the dark. So we're already down to a 30th, 13th of a second at f3.5. Okay, so it's time to get the tripod out. Sounds like good advice, doesn't it? And I came prepared. Well, almost, I had my tripod, but I left my tripod mount at home. All right, let's just, I guess, try and work it out. Okay, look, I have a tripod. I have a tripod. I have a tripod, which is the stand. I have a selfie stick attached to that stand. I can leave the GoPro on the selfie stick. I can actually attach the tripod to the camera and I'll handhold the selfie stick with the GoPro on it and I'll put this on the tripod. Okay, maybe I can relax a little bit now, we'll see. Slight change of plan here. We have the camera on a very small tripod, but it'll still work. I have my GoPro on a selfie stick and that means I should be able to shoot a little bit of low light photography with the self timer. The self timer is absolutely essential on a camera like this simply because it does not actually have a thread that'll allow you to put a remote shutter in there. Okay, so a pretty bland picture of a tree overhanging the coastline. And what I'm gonna try and do is shoot this one, I need a sixth of a second at around f3.5. That would be about a twelfth of a second at around f5.6, I guess. Okay, so another lazy photograph, really just trying to capture the sunset. Um, I don't think it's something that really sits itself to a square frame, let alone film. You can see that what I'm doing here is simply placing the horizon at the lower part of the frame and trying to make the most of the clouds in the background. All right, 
right, if I'm going to be honest, I'm much more of a sucker for the built environment than I am for nature. So let's see what we can get out of this. The composition again is actually probably quite suited to a square frame. If I zoom in, you probably can't see much of that, but we'll see how the final shot turns out. Let's knock it down, down to f4.5, a third of a second at f4.5. Oh, change the ISO back to 200. Not 160, 200. You're really being annoying this app at the moment. And so the message here is get here at least half an hour before you think you need to because it takes about 20 minutes to set up every shot. I can see how these landscape photographers have an incredible amount of patience. All right, so what I'm going to try and take now is a photograph of the groin and the lookout before the last sun disappears. And of course, I left my phone, didn't I? And you do realise that that'll be the second phone I've lost this year. The question is, where the hell did I put it so that I could take the last photo? There is the phone. All right, it says I'm gonna need one and a half seconds. I'm gonna risk it doing one second. See how we go. What is it? Oh, let's just take a photo of it anyway. I think you'll agree that that experience was perhaps a little suboptimal, but I'm also sure we can agree that it was a learning experience, for me anyway, or a traumatic experience at least. And looking at those last couple of photographs, you could be excused for thinking this camera is about as useful a photographic tool as a brick. But despite the similarity in appearance, it's not that heavy and it's an awful lot more elegant than a brick. Uh, if you're really looking for a TLR that you can club a seal with, then you might do better with a Mamiya C-Series camera. They have the benefit of being able to swap out lenses and were famous for breaking the backs of wedding photographers for most of the last half of the 20th century. The Yashica 635 is a baby in comparison, having more in common with a Rollerflex. Basically, Yashicas are a cheaper version fitting somewhere between the Rolleiflex and a Soviet or Chinese Lubatel or Seagull. The first Yashica was actually called a Pigeon Flex, and we all know both Seagulls and Pigeons are best known for stealing your lunch and shitting ingloriously on your car windscreen. That doesn't mean it was a bad camera, but since its release in 1953, the design was slowly refined through the 1970s and 80s, where the Yashica Mat 124G represented the pinnacle of industrial cool, including frivolous features like foam light seals and a match needle light meter. And yes, I am being sarcastic. Given that by this time this camera was retired, people were already shooting with autofocus SLRs. The 635 was introduced in 1958, though it was produced well into the 1970s. And this model included one thing that the Yashica Mat couldn't do, which was shoot 35 millimeter film with the help of an adapter. These kits are rare enough now that to buy one would probably cost you more than a good 35 millimeter camera, but hey, something for the collectors. Other than that, a TLR is a TLR, and the 635 operates like most others. You have two lenses. The one on the top is a fixed aperture viewing lens with a mirror behind it that throws the image up to the ground glass screen on the top of the camera to help you compose. The bottom one is the taking lens, and this is where all the action happens. It's geared to adjust your shutter speed and aperture and contains a Copal leaf shutter inside it that you cock on the side of the lens and release through a shutter button. There's a focus knob on the side and the two lenses move in tandem as you focus. So when it's in focus on the ground glass, it's also in focus against the film plane. Easy, I hear you say, but of course life is never that simple. 
While the lens reflex part of the TLR has a lot in common with a contemporary single lens reflex camera, there is one significant difference other than the one lens. And that's that SLRs have a prism that automatically corrects the image. With a TLR, everything is inverted. So what you see is effectively a mirror image and moving to the left shifts that image to the right. And even the vertical angle is inverted, so it makes it really difficult to get your horizon straight. Well, that's my excuse. I did warn you this was going to be an inventory of failure. In fact, this image inversion isn't exactly unusual. After all, we do see an inverted version of ourselves in a mirror. And if you ever bother to check your negatives um, when you run them through a camera, you'll see that the images themselves are upside down. It makes sense. The image on the back of our retinas are upside down too. That's what lenses do. And of course, we have lenses in our eyes. Yours might be a Zeiss Otis. Mine's probably more of a Holger, but we both see upside down. It's just that our brains are used to that, so we don't notice it. It's the power of habituation. Like when you first put on uh, socks or, or a watch for the first time, you feel a bit weird, but then sensation soon goes away. Unless, of course, like me, you wear an Apple Watch where you perpetually have the sense that you look like a bit of a dick. But hey, at least it's not an Apple Vision Pro. But I digress. The point is that over time, you get used to using a TLR. Research has shown that you can actually get used to seeing things upside down and the upside down goggles or reverse vision experiment is often replicated among psychology students, ostensibly to teach them how to do t-tests and scientific measurement. But really, we all know it's just to amuse their lecturers as they collide into each other and the classroom furniture like some puerile Gary Larson cartoon. It can actually take about four days for habituation to really kick in, so I probably shouldn't feel too bad about my slightly wonking framing at times. But more importantly, there's a side effect that if you've done it before, it's supposed to get easier over time. So to validate that particular psychological hypothesis, I took the Yashica out again, this time in daylight in the hope that I might actually have a better time of things. Yes, yes, I know. I'm just going to wait for the cars to go by and then I'm going to try and capture the front of this cafe at 500th of a second F8. Now I wonder if there's something I can do with these reflections of the black tiling and uh, enjoy some of that green of the window frames too. Okay, so what can I make of this? I think if I get down low and try and remove some of the clutter behind this, that could be an interesting shot, but we shall see. All right. 
Alright, so if I was to take that, then if I was to get down low, I could potentially capture that reflection too. Okay, 125th of a second at F10. Look at this shot, are you seeing this? Oh, Perfect. Nice. Perfection. I've got the whole man in there. You'll be so proud. Nice angles. Yeah. Leading lines, you see that? Yeah. Leading lines, yeah. Got yeah, that. I've got it all. Now that's pretty impressive and I would actually love to get that reflection in the window but I think that would have to be a separate shot from this one because uh, I don't want that YHQ sign in there at all. Still not perfect, but getting there and having decent light removed one of the variables. At least this time, I felt that you got to see some of the character of the camera. First to the downsides. You'll notice that I did get some overlap in the images and I put that down to rushing the film loading process. You'll see the backing paper didn't fully catch initially and wasn't lined up so well so that the film feed was a little bit glitchy. Normally that's not a problem because the winder does have a hard stop when it hits the right point and you have a neat little counter in the window above the winder. You actually have to remember to wind the film on though. There's nothing to prevent you from doing double exposures, which can be a cool creative feature. But as you can see, uh, less useful if you're forgetful like me normally. I just get into the habit of winding it on after every shot and as long as you don't cock the shutter you won't be taking a picture by accident. What you do get when you get it right though are glorious images. You get all that medium format resolution and character with the f3.5 lens enabling a nice shallow depth of field. So when it works, it works well. The 80mm Yashinon lens provides a 35mm equivalent of about 44mm, so fairly standard and in their day TLRs were quite capable street photography tools. Proto Selfie Queen Vivian Mayer used one and the form factor of these things is quite small. Combined with the fact that you're looking through a waist level finder and there's a chance your subject won't notice you awkwardly twiddling knobs and trying to frame. There's no reason you can't stop it down. Zone focus and shoot away. Vivian Mayer did use a Rollerflex though and this is not a Rollerflex. Similar in size and operation but perhaps not quite as refined. But at the prices that Rollerflexes are going for compared to this camera I'm okay with that. One of the problems with a TLR is that while it may have been discreet in the 1950s or 60s, walking around certain streets with a Rollerflex is like carrying a sign that says mug me. I've never had a problem personally, um, but it's rare that I go out with my Yashica and not have some random person come up and ask me, what is that? Or regale me with nostalgic stories about photography back in the day. For this reason alone, it makes a good occasional companion rather than your everyday carry. Another reason to buy a slightly cheaper TLR as well. And honestly, the main point of difference between the 635 and Rolleiflexes or the later Yashica Mat 
is the lens. It's not technically as perfect, but who cares? The Yashinon is sharp where it matters, and it oozes character with subtle vignetting and slightly soft corners, drawing you into the square frame when shot wide open. It definitely has that square, medium format look. I did notice one problem, and I'm not sure if it's an issue with flaring or whether there's a light leak. It doesn't appear outside the frame on the negative or in the same position every frame, so either it's a light leak in the lens chamber, internal reflections, or flare from the 60s lens coating, but that's something I'm going to have to look into. And if you do have any suggestions, please let me know in the comments. If there's another weakness, it's that the minimum focusing distance is about a meter. And while that's fine for group shots and upper body portraits, it doesn't get you close up. Even at its modest minimum focus distance, you're going to have to account for parallax error because of course it has a separate viewfinder to the taking lens. But you've got room to crop and one of the cool features of it being able to take 35 millimeter film is that will actually do it automatically for you, making your 44 millimeter equivalent lens closer to an 80 millimeter portrait lens. And using the sharpest part of the optic too. Using this as a 35 millimeter camera kind of defeats the purpose. And as I said, if you don't already have the 35 millimeter kit, the cost is prohibitive. If you're looking to have some fun, you can do what I did and buy some cheap film adapters that allow you to fit a 35 millimeter film cartridge into the 120 film bay. If you stick the film to a leader of an old used cartridge, you can effectively feed the film back in so that as you take photos, you can remove the exposed film without needing to change it in a bag or in the dark room. It's fun and it gives you those cool exposed sprockets if you scan it on a flatbed. If you do want to shoot in landscape format though, that can be challenging given the need to accommodate the wibbly wobbly mirror world viewing experience. Yes, another excuse for my photographic failures. So how have all these errors educated us? Well, we've learned to arrive early, Bring your bits and bobs and don't lose anything. Learn how to calculate exposure properly and most importantly, get to know your camera. Really, these things are true for any kind of photography, even if they seem particularly pertinent to the Yashica 635. It's not a perfect camera by any means. Uh, my particular copy has quite a dull viewfinder and the lack of a light meter and quirky operation does slow you down. But there's a charm to looking at the world sideways from above and all the mechanical construction does give a tangible sensory quality to the photographic process. And when you do get to finally see the images, when you do get a good one, you quickly forget all the frustration that it takes to actually make that picture. It's a camera with flaws, but all the flaws are fixable. Unlike me, I've been told I'm totally beyond repair, though I think my wife meant beyond reproach when she said that. She may disagree. But look, thank you for walking along in my misplanted footsteps with the Yashica 635. As Winston Churchill once said, success is not final. Failure is not fatal, and it's the courage to continue that counts. If you want to continue to vicariously experience my abject humiliation, then don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, because I promise there'll be plenty more of my photographic foundering to come. Later.